This is Sedgefield, County Durham, a pretty little village surrounded by this lovely farmland, and we've got a mystery to solve. Over there, a metal detectorist found these. A hundred Roman silver and bronze coins, these broken brooches, and this extraordinary goat amulet. But why are they here? Maybe this air photograph can help. You see all these crop marks, which look to me remarkably like buildings. But are they some previously unknown Roman fort or town or part of a temple complex? Could these coins be part of a hoard that was buried and lost nearly 1,500 years ago? Time team, I've got just three days to find out. This is pretty near Hadrian's Wall, isn't it? That's right. We're, we're in the military part of Roman Britain, northern Britain, but unfortunately this is a complete blank on the map. So we've got a really exciting prospect here to put a new mark on that map and explain what was going on here in the Roman period. Yeah. Sedgefield's surrounded by Roman military sites. If there'd been a fort or camp here, it surely would have been discovered by now. So could we be on an unknown civilian settlement? But where do we start? Well, we're going to do some geophysics, but we've got a great ploughed area. And of course, at the moment, we've only got metal finds from this. So if we do some field walking, we might get the pottery. Yeah. And that would really tell us something. What we're going to ask you to do is each of you to walk one 20 metre square. And you'll be walking it for 20 minutes. We'd like you to pick up everything. So if you, you think it might be a bit of pottery, but you're not sure, put it in anything metal, glass, even modern pottery as well. We, we want the lot. For the people that are doing the detector survey, if you can go along behind the field walkers, and if you could turn any discrimination on your machines off, so you're looking out for any signals at all, copper alloy or ferrous, um, and hopefully we might have some nice finds. The aim of the field walking is to see if we can identify any pattern of finds in the field. Oh God, that's really nice as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a bad first find, is it? Not bad. No, nice early Roman coin. Yep. Where you find coins and metal, you should find loads of pottery. The field walkers and detectorists are working to a grid set up by Geophys, who've already surveyed most of the ploughed field. This is a pretty big area, almost 20 acres, so with only finds and crop marks to go on, it's a bit like pin the tail on the archaeological donkey. But you've got some uh, results for us now. Which he you? hasn't shown me yet. yet. <laughs> and there you are. Oh, crikey. Good well, Lord. Wow, that's brilliant. That is such a relief. I Not have this. to tell you that behind the scenes, he's been going, oh, I don't think there's anything no, here. I don't know no, what we're going to do. So that is a great no, relief no doubt, to see all that there. That's brilliant. I mean, we're getting really good correlation with the aerial photographs. Yep. These enclosures yep. and ditches. I mean, that's the, the thing that I see when I look at these results. Yep. I see ditches. Right. I, I don't see wall foundations. You don't think buildings. any areas like this might be settlements? Well, well there might be. I think it's all to do with settlement. Right. Yeah, well, and good. what sort but of activity would these blobs indicate? Well, those are intriguing. They, they really are. They're about four or five metres across. Because we, have no, we have no idea of date for no. this, have we, at all, really. So we need to find that out first of all. OK, so where do you think we should put the first trenches in? Well, if we went for the junction of that enclosure... Yeah, because it looks as if ditch. that's butted up against that enclosure, doesn't it? But then one trench that goes across the enclosure and takes in one of the blobs? Yeah. You happy now? That's great, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm very relieved to see that. <laughs> right, and if you could leave the tape clean... <laughs> OK, sorry about that. It's so, going back to me. 15 oh, metres, long. this one. I didn't realise it was going to be this long. Yeah. So, how big was the geophys that you did? We, we've then? actually done the whole field, 200 metres by 60 in that plot. That was so the that's, whole field? Yeah. It's going to be a big trench, isn't it? Yeah, but it, we'll, we've got big machines.
With two trenches underway, geophys turned their attention to the ancient parkland alongside the ploughed field. The park hasn't been farmed for centuries and could reveal completely undisturbed archaeology. I took the opportunity to catch up with Alan Luton, the detectorist who found all the Roman metal finds. So eight years ago, you were walking along this field yep. with your metal detector, and then what happened? Well, I just suddenly started finding Roman coins. I mean, normally you may expect to find the odd Roman coin, like casual loss, because supposedly there's a Roman road going along the bottom of the field, or yeah. so they say. But I started to find the odd silver coin, and then a couple of bronze coins, and then they started to form a pattern, a few brooches, and I, I just had the feeling that this had been some sort of a settlement site, maybe it's a, a Roman camp or something like that, a marching camp. Had you uh, ever found anything like this before? No. No. And have you ever found anything like this since? No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Alan's lent us all his finds for expert analysis. Well, we can see at a glance, I mean, we've got mainly Roman coins there and some Roman objects like that Roman brooch, but we've got some medieval objects here like this lead pilgrim souvenir. What excites me at first glance is we've got lots of these large coins, which are fairly early Roman coins. Unfortunately, they're not in very good condition. There's a quite a spread of dates there right from the outset. Well, and that's what we really want to know, is the spread of dates, not just sort of Roman and medieval, but also within the Roman period, because it's a long time, the Roman yeah. period. You tend to dismissively think Roman's just Romans, but it's 350 years, and we really need to know mm. when we've got the concentrations of finds. Yeah. Are they early Roman or 100 years after the Roman conquest or what? With the field walking complete, Kynwin makes an initial assessment of the finds. A piece of Samian, that's lovely. I mean, that's what we were hoping to find. We've got a nice rim piece there. Yes. A lovely finish on it. That's survived so well. Have we got any different types of pottery coming from any of the squares? Classic, lovely. And we'd expect to find um, some greyware here. Have we got any finds that aren't pottery or coins? Yeah, kind of. It's <gasps> beautiful, yes. Oh, no. wow. <laughs> lovely. That is absolutely lovely. It's either going to be jet or lignite. It's been pierced for suspension yeah. as well. So we've got pendant, part of a jet pendant, probably second century, maybe third. That's beautiful. Phil, is it looking like anything? It is actually, just as a geophysics said it would be. This is the, 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 the point of reference, this enormous great big yeah. blob. Now that oh, this is this dark is, is area this we're in, is very, this? very dark area right where you where we are now. Yeah. Now you're inside it. Yeah. And the actual edge of it comes round here. Oh, yes. I'm walking along the edge. These pebbles are the local sort of glacial gravels. Yeah. And that's veering on all the way round there. So this is huge, isn't it's it? It's a vast feature, enormous. But any finds from it at all? Nothing at the minute. I mean, all we've all we've taken literally is is the plough soil that's moved down the yeah. slope and has, has given yeah. us this big build-up of soil. Yeah. In trench two, Kerry and his team of diggers have uncovered an area of burning only half a metre down. Sprinkled across the surface are tiny fragments of melted bronze and lumps of slag containing copper and daub. Even Mick isn't allowed to walk on the delicate, fine, strewn surface, so Kerry learns to operate a camera. This is a bit of new technology you're going to impress me with, is it? It is. I'm going to show you what we found in here. Right, go on then. All this slagging that we've now found is confined to within the ditch. Right. So it's not a structure, it's been dumped in here. But surrounding it, we've got a large amount of pot, and we've got this piece here. Oh, crikey, yeah. Which, if I turn it over, is oh, a very yeah. nice rim. Great big rim, yeah. Um, clay here. Yeah. So what, you're thinking of this as a kiln or a furnace or something? I think so, yes. The same as here, there's daub oh, as well. Oh, crikey, yes. That's very burned, isn't it? And there's a nice little pot base oh, just here. More greyware. And then as we get to the burning, you can see all the charcoal. Yeah, And yeah. the daub in there. So we've got all the components of a furnace or a kiln, but it's dispersed. It's been dumped here, all spread here. So what are you thinking, that the kiln or the furnace isn't very far away from this dump? Could be, you could be right underneath where you're sat. Right. Over at the incident room, the slag sample's been x-rayed to try and find out more about how it was formed. You, you, you look at this, it's like, which way is the out point? See, at first we thought it might be a mould, you know? Yeah. Like, this is like a, a copper object inside a mould. But it seems too amorphous and the clay yeah. isn't a nice surface anywhere, so we yeah. think now... It's a crack in the furnace. Yeah. 
And also, you've got a large amount of slag that's attached to it. So it's yeah, like, why yeah. would you have that? So it's a process. On a mold? And it's really exciting because it means there was a, obviously a furnace on the site. Oh, yeah. All of these bits of bronze and burnt areas are a sure sign of industrial activity, but as yet no sign of habitation. And Phil's mysterious blob in Trench 1 is still causing Stuart a few headaches. Initially we thought this was a pit, but actually it turns out that it's a thick layer of burnt clay. This is this, all this red mass down here. That's it. What do you think it is? At the moment I've got no idea. The only finds we've got off of it are uh, some shards of Roman glass. Oh, let's look at that, yeah. No pottery at all? Not, well, we've got some Roman pottery from the layer above, but uh, nothing that would suggest, uh, you know, a kiln or uh, anything along those right. lines at the moment. Oh, crikey, look at that. It's very fine, isn't it? It's obviously a vessel because it's actually shaped. Yeah. Cool. The glass fragments are too small to even guess what they could be, and there are too few of them to suggest domestic habitation. The lack of finds in the trenches is becoming a worry, and Alan's coins are adding to the mystery. Right, how are we getting on with looking at these coins? Because we really need to start to try and get an idea of what sort of date stuff's coming in at. Right, we've got a pattern building up. We've got Roman material, in fact, one coin from the 1st century BC. Oh, really? 1st century AD, this large group from the 2nd century. We've got the 3rd century, and we've also got the 4th century. But then we've got a gap. And then after the gap? We start getting coins again from uh, the 1200s. We've got coins throughout the Middle Ages. We've got Tudor coins. We've got Stuart coins. We've got coins from the 18th century. We've got coins from the present century. Guy, what do you think's going on in the Roman bit? What's distinctive about this? Is it the typical sort of collection you'd expect? It's exactly not a typical collection. <laughs> what we've got here is quite a lot of silver coins. This is the equivalent of the £20 note. You don't go around chucking £20 notes away. What we've got very little of is the very small, low-value coinage, which ought to dominate these 3rd and 4th century I mean, that's groups. normally your Roman site is riddled with these little late things that are half For a piece. For each can't one be of these, we ought to have a couple of hundred of these and so there's a real mystery. So this looks like a neat pattern, but in fact there's another story weaved into this. So Alan, did you have any thoughts about what's going on in the Roman period in your site? Well, yes, uh, initially I mm -hmm. was under the assumption that this was probably um, a marching camp, you know, perhaps when the road was under construction at some point or when there were troop movements were needed further north up towards Hadrian's Wall, something like that. Did that fit with you guys? I've got a rather more radical suggestion. It <laughs> looks like a lot of coins, and Craig and I have been talking about this. All these, we think, probably come from a single collection. A hoard? A hoard. It's a one-site thing, and these may be the same. Alan, does that fit with how you found them? Were all these silver coins from sort of within six feet of each other? No, they weren't, no. They were scattered over an area about 80 metres, so quite a large area of the site. That's not necessarily incompatible with a hoard because if the cord pot that it would have been buried in was broken up through ploughing, you would expect them distributed over an area. But we shouldn't have this number of silver coins. If that was a hoard, would that then feel very much more typical? No, because even that is unusual. This lot might be a bronze hoard, and we've got some very late silver coins here. These are extremely rare, and these, I understand, Alan, were found very close to one another. Yes, they were, right. in another part of the, uh, the site. Yeah. So, in other words, we're looking at three possible coin hoards on this site. So, we've really got two very different theories at the moment. Either it might have been a military marching camp, and we might find some military stuff. On the other hand, it might be a site that people come back to at major intervals to bury hordes. So we've got a real mystery going on here. So why have we got this great hoard of silver coins? I don't know, it doesn't make any sense because they're high status objects and we're looking at very, very ordinary low status settlement here. Yeah, but look at the geophysics now, Mick. We've expanded the survey area. We've got this big roadway going through there. Right. I think we're well back from the action here. Yeah, I mean, this is beginning to look more like some sort of village settlement, isn't it? I mean, these look like the crofts yeah. of the individual farms, in which case we are right at the back That's right. of the back um, ditch of one of them. But would this be high enough status to justify the find of all these coins? I don't think so. I think we're still looking at a, a, a sort of Roman rural settlement, yeah. basically. OK, they might be doing a bit of industrial activity, but it's still not... You know, not high status at it's all. It's intriguing, isn't it? We've got this real mismatch. On the one hand, we've got the high status coins. On the other hand, we've got what appears to be a pretty low status site. Will we be able to link them up tomorrow at the top of our field? It's the beginning of day two in our search for a Roman settlement here in Sedgefield. We've opened two trenches based on fantastic geophys results, although we've only managed to find faint traces of industrial activity. 
but our metal detectorists and field walkers have apparently found loads of Roman archaeology lying about near the surface. It's all a bit of a mystery, really. We've got, we've got a lot of material from the field walking. We've got pieces of pottery, yeah. which Guy's just having a look at here. Yeah, those are both Roman, definitely don't Roman. Yep. Some of these look like they could be Roman, though, don't they? I'm, I'm rather less sure about that. You're not? Actually, oh. I'm afraid. No, no, you see, this very obviously modern Well, that's glass. obviously modern, yeah. What but about these bits of tile, no, though? No, they're not like Roman tile. The wrong thickness, they're the wrong colour. Yeah. But when our field walkers were going across the field, yeah. they kept going, ah, oh, Roman here, Roman, Roman here, yeah. Roman... That's because we're expecting to find a Roman site, but remember, we're very close to a town that's been there for centuries. People have been chucking their rubbish over here since time immemorial. But we have got one really good Roman coin, another silver denarius, just like the ones from the coin hoard I've been arguing we've got in the incident room. This is reinforcing your theory that what we've got here is a series of coin hoards and actually not much in the way of occupation. That's exactly. Is that absolutely what it looks like at the moment on the basis of the evidence we've got so far that is what it looks like. Guy, you're going to have to swallow your scepticism. The geophys is fantastic and even if that particular find <laughs> might not be Roman, I'm quite confident that a lot of stuff will be. <laughs> We've now got a complete geophys survey for the ploughed field and half of the parkland. It seems to show a continuous set of archaeological features on both sides of the fence and what looks like a Roman road connecting the two. It's quite a substantial roadway, I, I yeah. think. I mean, that's 20 metres apart, those yeah. ditches. Yeah. But um, surely, surely the thing to do is to, to establish that we've actually got buildings and settlement alongside that trackway. Well, that, that's why we've homed in on this area here. Yeah. I mean, that might Ooh. just be something like an oven, corn drying kiln. Right. Um, maybe a hearth. To open a new trench? Open a new trench that will take in your whatever it is, corn drying kiln, yeah. oven or whatever. And this area here is this bit blown up large, yeah? That's right. And where is it? Oh, we've marked it on the ground for you. <laughs> this bit here? Well, this being time team, that means that we're going to have to move the fines table and the fines and this rather large tent. Anyone lend us a hand? Can we move the tent? So we want to go sort of over here somewhere. All right? Okay, off we go. We've got to move it, sorry. Just about, I don't know, 20 metres? What a team. Phil's moved over from trench one in the field to take charge of the trench under the tent in the park. By his reckoning, the archaeology shouldn't be as deep here as there's been no ploughing or other soil disturbance since medieval times. To find out whether we're on a major Roman road or just a simple trackway, Cat's opening up trench four. We're practically halfway through the dig now, and I must admit, I haven't a clue what it is that we've got here. I looked at the geophysics plot, and as soon as I saw it, ladder settlement was a term that came out. What a ladder settlement is, Tony, is where you've got a road, a street, like that, and then you get enclosures coming off like that. We're talking about something that is basically a settlement of enclosures yeah. along a road, running roughly that way through that gate over there. Yeah and that some of these have got occupation in them and some of them don't. My guess would be that it's probably, there's probably a lot of farming going on, but that there's a lot of, it, of, of, of small scale industrial activity going on in the backyard. So even though there's nothing above the ground, and even though what we're seeing seems fairly rudimentary in terms of civilized yeah. life, you think this is actually significantly adding to our understanding of Roman oh, yeah. Britain? Mass massively yeah. so. Yeah. This would be the first site of this type, would it? north yeah. of the River yeah. Tees. Yeah. North of the Tees, there isn't one site like this known. A long, thin settlement along the road is beginning to fill in the gaps on the Roman map of Sedgefield. But yesterday's pottery finds are causing a problem. They're not fitting into the timeline of metal artefacts. Guy, you and Craig have obviously had a chance to do a bit of tidying yep, up on yep. the metal finds, mm -hmm. um, but haven't you moved them? They, these were all in the second century yesterday. Yeah. Well, you remember we thought they were coin hoards? Yes. Well, we're absolutely sure they're coin hoards that have been dispersed across the field. Now, the rule with a coin hoard is it can't be buried before the date of the latest coin in the hoard. Because it wouldn't have been made then. That, exactly. So this lot we know belongs to the early third century. This lot of coins down here are very, very worn. Although they're second century in date, they're so worn they must belong to a hoard that's gone in, in the third century. And right over here we've got our other little hoard of fourth century coins, but they're clipped down, which means 
coins, they belong to the period. They're probably still in circulation when the coinage is no longer being supplied to Britain, perhaps as late as the early 5th century. So that's moved all our coin activity into different periods. I mean, Guy, what do you reckon's actually going on here in the Roman period? Now we've got the sort of second century pottery, a completely different date from the time at which the hordes are buried, well, you we've say? Re we've really got a mystery here. If we come along here and found this pottery, I'd be perfectly happy to accept that this is a, this is a local phenomenon, a, a little minor settlement living on the economic edge, a few miles away from the Roman army over to the west where they've got shed loads of stuff. These are people with a very small scale economy. That's fine. Great, but it doesn't match with all this stuff, a high quality silver hoards and coinage going on later on. So for me, there's a real problem here. We've got a total mismatch in this. This mismatch has a huge implication for Alan, the detectorist who made all these finds. Confirmed as definite hoards, he's now going to have to declare everything to the coroner as possible treasure trove and risk losing half his finds. So is there a different law covering something that's a hoard as compared with something that isn't a hoard? Well, if it's, an, if it's a hoard, then it'll go to inquest and then it'll be decided what they are or what the value is. And then if any interested parties, say a museum or whatever, are interested in purchasing certain rare pieces, if there are rare pieces there, then they will have an option to buy, which is, which is great. Yeah. Other than that, then it's returned and then I can decide with the landowner whether we're going to share them out or, I suppose, sell them and split the market value. Phil's making good progress in Trench 3, where he's uncovered a circular feature ringed with burnt clay. So do you reckon this is a pit that's had some burning taking place in it? <sighs> it's difficult to say at the moment whether or not it's, it's actually a pit with burning, or, or in fact whether we're not looking at some, some big sort of structure that may actually have had a roof over it or something like that. You know, whether it could be some sort of a kiln or a, a, a furnace or something like that. At the moment, we just don't know what it is, um, except that it's just so well defined. The, the, the other incredible thing is, look how near the surface it is compared with all the trenches that we dug in the field yesterday. Why do you we, think that might be? Ploughing. It must be ploughing. This is, has, has only been ploughed in, in the medieval period when they had very, very simple ploughs that didn't actually penetrate the, the ground very far. Now we got, you know, in, in more recent times, steam ploughs and well, you know what they, they do nowadays, just, just wreck everything. Given that Time Team came here because of coin finds, and given that we found loads of evidence for Roman industry, it seems appropriate that we're attempting to combine them both. We're going to make Roman coins with traditional materials and techniques. But Craig, surely we know how Roman coins were made. Goodness knows we find enough of them. We find absolutely shed loads of Roman coins, but what we do not find is any archaeological evidence for the technology which produced these big brass coins. There are virtually no dies, there is no written record, there's no mint site which we've been able to identify. So no, we really, really don't know. This is a huge experiment. We're going to make the plain brass blanks and then we're going to also cast the bronze dies and we've got to engrave the dies and then we have to figure out how to use them so that we can get this impression on the hard coin. We're using bronze dies on brass coins. So we're going to actually try and do each of those three stages. Mm -hmm. And the really exciting thing about it is there are really important questions to answer at every single one of those stages. For example, look at this coin. You see the straight edges on that. Now, one theory is that that's because they were made by cutting them out from big ingots. One being cut out there, next one being cut out like that. With this. No, I don't think so. Because I just think it would take it would be so difficult to hammer out all those round edges. And if you're thinking about mass production, how you know, producing lots and lots of these coins, you're you're not gonna spend a lot of time doing this and it's not really in a metal worker's repertoire too. So how do you think out. they were made? I think they were cast individually. Before we can test any of these theories, Victor needs to hand engrave the bronze dies. Using a real coin as a pattern and only authentic tools, he's got hours of painstaking work ahead. Guy, we've got some Roman coins. Hello. <gasps> Hi, what's your name? Matthew. Hello, Matthew. I'm Guy. Nice to meet you. So, Matthew, where were these found? In my garden. Did you pick them out yourself? No. Oh. Who got them? My dad. Did he? What did you think lovely. of them? Gosh, that's fantastic. In fact, that's almost better than some of the coins we've found on our site. Mm. Do you know how old that one is? Um, 
No. It's 1,900 years old. This is from the middle of the 4th century, and this is an emperor called Magnentius. Which How is do you know trip. that? It just looks like a great clod of iron. I can read the lettering on the side, Tony, <laughs> you see. Also, it's the shape of the head, and he's got a bald head here, uh, which was a distinctive feature of that particular emperor on most of his coins. These coins came from the other side of modern Sedgefield, which seems to prove Stuart's ladder development theory that the settlement was spread out along the trackway. But it's still too early to say which part of the settlement we're actually digging in. Phil's trench has now been extended, and at last we're starting to find evidence of structure, small piles of arranged stones that could have supported a floor. The circular burnt feature is proving extremely hard to interpret. Hey, what the devil that is? Well, you're getting to the critical point there. The circular wall is a seemingly complete bowl shape with a small clay dome at the centre. Just suppose that that actually still dives yeah, on down and, and, there, and that eh? Is collapsed in. Well, and it, that is actually collapsed. It could all, it could all Mick and Phil's best guess for the moment is that it's some sort of collapsed furnace or kiln, the dome in the centre being the top of the fallen roof. But there's still a lot of earth to be moved before they'll know for sure. Hi there, how are you getting on making those blanks? Hey, at last we've actually got something that's working. Oh, they look um, brilliant, those little round orange glowing leather blanks. No, they're, they're wonderful, aren't they? All it is is just little dimple moulds in a clay base. And what you can do is you can stack loads of them on top of each other, measure out the metal straight mm. into the top of that, and then fire up the whole kiln. So it's just like making chocolates? Yeah. So was it really that simple? Did you try any other methods, Dana? We did try some other methods. We were looking at the coins with the straight edges and trying to reproduce that, and cutting it from the ingot took um, 15 minutes. So not perhaps ideal for mass production. Not very effective. <laughs> and then we also did this where we, we made these as wax individual blanks and put them into plaster mold and poured through the top. And that's another method that's been suggested and would produce a flat surface. Yeah. So, and you've tried several different methods which have all worked to some degree. We've oh. got stuff we can work with tomorrow, but if you're looking for mass production, industrialized process. That's the one. Victor's almost finished engraving the dies. They seem to work well enough on clay, but will they be strong enough to survive being hammered into a brass blank? What do you think of that, Craig? Oh, I think that's absolutely astonishing. I think we've got a forger in the making. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should take that as a compliment, Victor. It's almost the end of the day, and Trench 4 is well underway trying to find the edge of the Roman road and any trace of domestic settlement. It's about five o'clock. It's really chilly. I think the wind's coming directly from Russia. Catherine, can I come in your trench? Yep, definitely. What have you got here? Well, we've not had a lot so far, but what we're starting to get is these, you know, fist-sized pebbles in here, similar to what Phil's had in his trench. And so basically we're just looking at this, seeing if it's some sort of surface. So might that be a surface that people are living in, or is it more likely to be some kind of path? Well, we're not sure yet. We think we could be on, on the same alignment as a trackway, but we've not got any evidence to, uh, to show that. So it could be something domestic on the side of a road. But there is something different here. But there's definitely something yeah. coming up there now, yeah. What about here? Yeah. This just all looks similar texture to me. And I think we've got the roadside ditch coming through here. Oh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> here, where I'm standing. You can't really see from here, but if you come back up here, yeah. you can see it looks a lot darker over there where we were than here. It's a bit lighter here than just up here. It's pretty much eye of faith, isn't it? I think I'm going to have to wait till tomorrow when you've cleaned it up a bit. When we've cleaned it up, maybe. At the moment, I can't see anything at all. What else have we got? Well, what we've got is um, what showed up on the geophysical survey as that big circular blob. Is this here? Yep, yeah, we've got the edge coming through here with all this burnt stuff oh, on the side. Here. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah, see that. All Actually coming see through that. here. Yeah. <laughs> so what we've done is we've taken it down and then we've, we've dropped this huge sondage in here, which is about two metres deep from the side. So this is like a test bit, yeah? Yeah, just like a test bit. And we managed to find this bits of uh, amphora at the bottom. Now, how do you know that's an amphora? Well, this bit here looks like it's part of the, the handle. Oh, right. Because yeah. it's so chunky. Yeah. And the uh, amphora wear is all you know, massively chunky. So we know that we're still. We in know a we're Roman, Roman layer. and we've had a coin come out of the spoil. So that's been dated to AD 69. So we were definitely Roman, which is great. So, what are we doing this enormous trench next? 
What we're going to do is we're going to clear it up, see if we can spot that ditch that we're looking for, have a look at that, that area down there, see if it's something domestic. Basically just clean it up and see what we can find. Invisible road ditches, an amp for a handle and a coin are not exactly what I would call conclusive proof of domestic habitation. And Kat's only got one more day to find it. Phil's trench has yielded no domestic finds and his kilny furnacey thing has now developed flu holes, which proves it's a kiln of some sort. So we know that people were working here at one time, but were they living here as well? Niall, do these stones say house to you? They do indeed, Tony. I think what we've got here is a rough stone foundation uh, for a timber frame building. Big wooden sleeper building raising up a timber superstructure and then the rest of the building running off towards the road front. Do you reckon there's enough evidence here to tell us that there was a village here at one time? Yeah, I find it difficult to believe that that uh, geophysics plot with the street down the middle and all the tenements down each side is not actually a Roman village. You're the local expert. What do the patterns that we've seen through the geophys tell us about what was going on here? Um, it tells us we've got something quite exceptional going on here. The normal pattern of Roman occupation um, in the far north of England is forts with civilian settlements outside them, little farmsteads. Here we've got something that's quite atypical and far more like the thing you get much further south in a much more Romanised landscape. So is this an important size? Exceptionally important. Mick, apart from Nile stones, we really don't have much evidence of occupation, do we? Are we going to? I think so. We've only dug one plot so far on this village street. I think we need to dig two or three more up in that direction and hopefully we'll get an assemblage of material, pottery bone and so on, that will more clearly indicate settlement. Beginning of day three in our quest to find out exactly what was going on here nearly 2,000 years ago. I'm travelling along what geophys have proved to be a Roman road or more probably a Roman trackway. We've got lots of evidence of industry and agriculture here, but very few clues about where the early inhabitants of Sedgefield actually lived. There's been a lot of midnight oil burnt trying to work out what to do next, but I've got a feeling there's going to be quite a few trenches dug here today. Phil? <sighs> That's a very stylish motor you got there, Tony. <laughs> Pretty stylish little trench you've got here too. We have finally cracked it, we reckon. What is it? Look what happens when I pull out this bag. We've got another flue hole in there. Mm. And what we realise now is that, in fact, instead of this being the collapsed roof of a big dome thing, this is actually part of the structure. And we can actually tell you what the structure is too, because all the way around here, look at all these bits of pot, undoubtedly a pottery kiln. Okay. Uh, this is probably the remains of the last load of pots that they actually fired. I had a chance to clean it up a bit and have a look at it. And a lot of these pieces are fitting back together. Ooh. I don't know if you can see that. We've got part of the same pot there. It looks very much like a lot of second century forms, but we haven't got examples like this from this area. And the, the pieces are so big and they're so fresh. They are. And this is the weird bit. If you turn it over on the bottom, can you see there? It's well, not being used. No. Just, to, just as they wired it off the wheel. Absolutely, yeah. It's still fresh. I thought that around here the Romans imported all their pottery. Well, that's what a lot of people think, but it's obviously not the case here. So this is actually quite an important find. It is, yeah. This is quite possibly the northernmost civilian pottery kiln ever discovered in England. Perhaps Sedgefield's potters sold their wares to the passing military on their way to Hadrian's Wall. I've spotted a new trench next to Phil's kiln. I think I'll go the long way round. Hiya. I thought another trench would be going in pretty soon. <laughs> Why here? Well, we're still looking along this street for evidence of, uh, if you like, more obvious occupation. Yeah. And we've got a series of, of, of blobby pity things, I think, aren't we? So we've Do gone we? in on those yeah. three large pits to see if we can get any domestic refuse, in effect. Kerry, wh what have you actually got there? We've got a capping for a pit here. There's another pit here and another one at the other end of the trench. So What's you've got all three? We've got all three. I don't understand what additional information you're getting from this that you haven't got elsewhere. It just seems to me that we're confirming the three bits of evidence that we've got elsewhere on yeah, the Yeah, but side. we're still looking for domestic refuge, mm -hmm. in effect. People need to be convinced that this is a settlement by finding 
waste material, bones and... Yeah, I mean, I wasn't going to admit it last night, but it is odd that it doesn't have animal bones, you know, smashed up. Why is that odd? Well, because, you know, almost every site you look at has got people, you know, joints of meat and, and all the rest of it, and there's nothing. Very, very strange. So that might imply that it's not residential, whereas last night you were saying you thought that it probably I was. I think it's a, a, lot of, a lot of vegetarian crafts. <laughs> <laughs> Over in Trench 4, Cat's making great progress excavating the roadside ditch. Just the sort of place your average Roman artisan might throw the remains of his dinner. Hello, Catherine. Hi. Has it been worth opening this enormous trench after all? Yeah, it's been very successful. Can I get down? Yes, yeah, certainly. What have you got? Well, we've just started to excavate this yep. roadside ditch mm -hmm. and we're just starting to get a lot of bone. Wow. Now, that's something we've been really short of. Actual evidence for people living and eating here. And that came out from there? Yeah, that came out all through this fill mm. in here. Right, what else have we got out of the trench? Well, we've been excavating the um, big massive quarry pit at the end of the trench, Great. remember on the geophysical. Yep, yep, yep. And we've just started to get some uh, bone out of this, but interestingly, we've got it about three metres down. Good. And uh, these quernstones. Right, quernstones. Of course, if they're living here, they're going to need bread, and that would be for grinding the corn. But, you know, I've got a real feeling that the quernstones are not necessarily going to be just for that. Right. Um, some of these seem to have been used as the kick wheels on a potter's wheel. See, and we know the pottery made over there was wheel made. Yep. So this could be the thing that you're pushing around at the bottom to turn the pottery oh, on. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Things are looking up. That's, that's great. Excellent. A few bits of sheep bone out of a ditch in one trench is hardly conclusive proof of domestic habitation. So we've opened trench six further along, but still fronting onto the Roman road, the most likely place that the Roman inhabitants of Sedgefield would live. Can you see there are some linear feature coming through here? It's got a really kind of silty matrix to the soil. Um, we've got bits of charcoal, and it just looks redeposited. It's like something's happened. Plus, we also have this, something happening here. Can you see that? There's a, a right The darker angle. soil There's in front of you. darker soil just here. As opposed to the orangey to, to the side. this orange gravel on the side. And then we've got this dark, kind of really sandy, silty stuff. So we might have right remnants of slots. Maybe. I, I, think, I think you've got to give it a good clean. I think you're right. I think we do have to give it a good clean. There may be something here. Once again, almost invisible archaeology. In this case, subtle soil staining where the timbers forming the base of a wooden building may once have lain. Over at our Roman industrial site, we're just about ready to try and strike some Roman coins. Andrew, we're ready to do our first experimental striking now, aren't we? And we're going to do the least risky one first. That's right. Because I think we're all really worried that Victor's die is going to break. <laughs> I'm really worried because I spent two days hard slog on that. Very hard work, still. It's all yours. What we're going to go for is just heating up the blank, getting it to just under cherry red, right? Putting onto the die, and instead of taking one almighty blow at it, just do a whole series of more gentler blows and try and tease it in there rather than forcing it in. Is there anything there? <laughs> no. Because no. it really glanced aside. It has to yeah. be, yeah. Dana, do you still want to try a cold stripe you were keen on? Well, I'm not as confident, but I would like to try it, yes. <laughs> wow, nothing. nothing. No impression. Not a. Nothing. Okay. Yes! Da, 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 da. Well, that's been a fantastic experiment, hasn't it? Because we've managed to rule out the methods that don't work, and we now know that a hot strike with one big blow using a bronze die would have been able to strike huge numbers of coins without damaging the mould. Phil, I've been looking at maps and surveys and I found a few anecdotes which you might be interested in relevant to the kill. <laughs> yeah. The whole foundation of this settlement was probably because of the quality of the clay here. A natural resource. It, it, it speaks marvels for the quality, yeah. There's a, a survey in 1380 by Bishop Hatfield which actually records kilns in Sedgefield. Yeah. And in 1673, the guy who actually owned this land left 25,000 bricks in his will. <laughs> <laughs> and in the 19th century, there were field names, tile shed plantation, brick kiln plantation, just beyond the woods there. So that the tradition starts here in the Roman period 
and kilns and tile making and so on, carry right God, through yeah. to the present day. Just goes to show, I mean, when this old potter built this kiln here, little did they know the tradition that they would be setting up. Come on, Mick, this is some trench, isn't it? Yeah, we've just decided to extend it back into here as well. Why? Well, we think we might have a building, some sort of structure. I'm not sure if it actually is an entire building, think probably more of a room. There um, is no building there. Of course there's a building there. <laughs> <laughs> we thought Can we'd have this trouble. Can you see it? No, absolutely not. Okay, we've got it running down here. Yes. We're getting to a corner. Oh, I can see the turn, you see yeah. The, you see the return? It's coming all the way back here. We've got another return here. And then we're coming all the way back until we get to a T-section. So you reckon you've got a rectangular building or possibly a rectangular room that's part of a larger building? It must be a room of, of a structure. And you do think it's a house? Because I've been saying I don't think there's any settlement here. I think this is industrial stuff out in the fields, but this would change that. It would definitely change that. This is your last chance, Mick, isn't it, to find any settlement it, it, out it, in this It site. is, it is. And, you know, the, the thing that's worrying here is we've had virtually no finds so we've far, We've had we? none out of this area whatsoever. Yeah. We've had finds within the trench and other features, but we haven't had actually anything in this. Yeah. So what are you going to do? We're going to have to cut some sections into it, see if we can get a profile, see um, if we can find some finds. We have roughly two hours left. No problem, Tony. Easy peasy, we'll get it done. She may get it done, but will I be able to see it? At least Phil's kiln's easier to understand, but he's running out of time as well. He's being slowed down by even more flue holes, which require very careful excavation. Oh. We suspect that we're in the middle of a civilian industrial area that may have provided goods for the military heading north to Hadrian's Wall but we've found no military artefacts to back oh, this up until now. My word, that's copper alloy, isn't it? it is, I think it looks like is a that, bucket handle. It's definitely looking handle shaped, isn't it? Mm. When it's cleaned up, the bucket handle looks too fragile and small to carry any real weight, but it's definitely a handle for something. So what Roman object needed a small bronze carrying handle? Craig and Guy came up with the solution. Once used by a soldier to attach his helmet to his belt or shoulder strap, it obviously broke, and he must have come to a local metal worker for a replacement. We've almost run out of time, and our search for domestic habitation in Trench 6 is finally over. So, Bridget, did it turn into a house? In a word, no, I don't think it is. Oh, right. <laughs> what do you think it is, then? I think it's a single-cell building. Right. No evidence of humans living in here. No, no hearth it. or oven or anything like that? Absolutely nothing, not even a piece of pot for it. Huh, so what's it for then? I think it might be for animals. I think oh. they come in here, kept overnight. So it might be a, a pig pen or something like that? I think that's about it. I'll go and tell everybody you found a pig pen. <laughs> OK. You big old piece. Phil's almost finished clearing out his kiln. All his effort is worth it, as we can see inside the fire chamber for the first time in 2,000 years. Fed from a stoke hole at the side, this is where the wood or coal would have burned. The flames shooting up through the vent holes to fire the pots stacked around the bowl of the kiln. The heat would have been kept in by a thin clay domed roof, which the potter would smash after every firing to get his pots out. This is one of the most amazing things we've ever found, an almost complete Roman pottery kiln. And once the pots had been fired, our Roman potter might have walked through his workshop past his workbench stacked high with completed pots, opened his front door and gone out into the main street. We've established that this was a major Roman trackway heading from the south off towards Hadrian's Wall. The chances are that this previously unknown Roman settlement could extend for miles along the trackway. We've discovered at least 20 different enclosures just in the field and park. 
This was obviously a thriving industrial area, making pottery and smelting bronze for the growing Roman market. It must have been a lucrative market too, because at least three people over a 300 year period were rich enough to bury their coins in the fields and lose them. I think we can safely say that Sedgefield may not have been a city of forums and amphitheatres, but it certainly deserves its place on the Roman map of Britain. After we'd all gone home, Phil had a surprise visit from the local MP, eager to see for himself his constituency's Roman heritage. How long have you been associated with this place? It's getting on for 20 years 20 now. 20 years, you see. You just don't know what's under well, around you. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly a revelation. Would this have been a camp? No, yeah. this, 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 this is, is an a, actual this is a, this or, is a real or, settlement. Or, yeah. It's fabulous for local people too to know something about their history. That's right. And know, know what was here. And so how many people do we reckon would have been here? Or we just can't tell. Can <sighs> well, I mean, you've got, tw tw you got 20, 20 enclosures, maybe you've got 20 families or yeah. something like that. These people, I mean, I know this sounds a sort of basic idiotic question, but I mean, they will have been Romans. No, they would have been more likely to be the local people, the local people. That, that actually uh, absorbed the Roman right. culture. This field is just, just a, it is just a, a gem. It's of, a real of, find, is it? This too right, it is really. <laughs> oh, I'm so proud. <laughs> Next on Discovery Channel, a look at the very public rivalry of celebrities. Today we'll find out the truth about the competition between Alain Prost and Ayrton Senna.